Okay, good morning everyone and thank you very much for taking time out of your busy days to join our webinar on how to keep staff and pupils safer in school. In just a minute, I will hand over to two of our technical experts, Dr. Cole Moore and Jamie Woodall, who will share with you hygiene expertise that is taken from real life experience as a service provider with over 100 years of experience and who is working with over 7,000 schools in the UK. We hope you will learn a lot from this webinar, but if you have any burning questions at the end of the session, then we'll be finishing with a Q&A, so um, you can ask any questions you have at that point. Now, without further ado, please let me hand over to Dr. Cole Moore. Right, I'll, uh, I'll just flick on once I get control of the keyboard there, Katie. There we go. So thanks for that. Um, we're going to flick through um, a series of, of slides will hopefully bring you through a story, um, if I can flick through. <laughs> uh, hang on. Big pause, okay. Ah, there we go. Lovely. So <clears throat> I'm just going to bring you through the first half of this. <clears throat> and my colleague Jamie, Jamie Woodall is going to bring you through the second half. First is what, what is coronavirus? Um, and it's all about reducing the risk. Um, identification is key. Where are the hotspots? Where, where can we start to control things? Um, a few little myths that I want to, to uh, blow out of the water, cutting through the noise. Hats then, we're going to give you some tools and tips around how to try and reduce the risks. So we have a little model um, which we can share with you. Um, and then how can we help? And then summary and a few questions. Okay, so hopefully we get something. You'll get something, everybody will get something different out of this. Um, there's a serious delay on this, sorry Katie. <laughs> you might drive for me actually, if that's, if yeah. That's what we do. Okay, so coronavirus, if we just click on, uh, we just click on for this slide, there's a few uh, animations. This, um, this bug has been with us, well, we believe anyway, uh, since last year, it might even be before that, but it's SARS-CoV-2 is, is the proper name. The disease um, is COVID-19, um, and people sort of mix, a, mix and match those terms, but the, the disease is COVID-19, and SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, which is a, a variety of, of virus, which um, we have a lot of, I have to say. Um, this particular one is quite nasty because the, the mortality rate is quite high with it. Um, so we, you can see there from the stats, we've you know more than 30 million known cases globally and nearly a million people dead, uh, which is, is a frightening stat. And here in the UK, um, we've, we've over 390,000 confirmed cases and over four, 41,000. It's we're, we're touching on 42,000 um, cases of, of death. But the, the, it's really about getting back to normal, as normal as we can. I do hate that term, but we are living in the middle of a pandemic and it is about trying to um, be as normal, get the economy going, get um, our children educated, um, there's so many different impacts that this virus has had, not only on the economy, but also our mental health and our children's education and mental health. So the, the policy is, to, right across the globe, is to open up schools, and that's so much so the UK government is is uh, is committed to doing that. You just flick on there, Katie. So it's all about breaking the chain of infection. In order to have a chain, we need a, we need a pathogen. And the, as I said, the pathogen in this case is the coronavirus. And typically, what, what we're, when we have a, a sort of a cycle of transmission, we have um, a reservoir. Now, the reservoir is being searched for, so we don't know what this what this reservoir, where it originates from. Some people say it's pangolins, some people say it's bats. A lot of research groups out there looking for the source, so they can understand how to battle this um, virus that little bit better. 
But when we sort of bring it into our into our environments, um, a reservoir could be somewhere where we we it's like a portal of entry where we go to to then further spread um, the virus. And one example of that is the washroom, where everybody goes to, and it all depends on their behaviour, those individuals' behaviours about hand hygiene and cleanliness, as to how much is going to get cross-infected via touch and also by the aerosol. The mode of transmission then is going to be either direct or indirect. So if I stand in front of somebody and I'm sneezing and talking and I have I have COVID-19, um, I'm going to then spread it through the aerosol. That's direct um, there to Jamie, for example, although we're on a, a, a digital platform. But uh, just say he is sitting beside me. Um, he's going to get directly transmitted uh, the virus from me. And then indirect would be what we know about is touch. So I would sneeze on a surface and then that surface, then somebody else could touch that and then touch their eyes, their nose, their mouth, and they could then get the, the, uh, the virus inside them. So it's all about breaking this chain. Um, and we do this by a variety of, of um, um, methods, such as washing hands, cleaning surfaces. We cover, we have cough etiquette, covering our, covering our mouths when we cough. Um, my child, my, my two children, um, constantly cough into their elbows. And when they wash their hands, my resounding memory of the pandemic will be uh, listening to the tune of happy birthday uh, song because uh, they're washing their hands for 20 seconds. Um, the, the other one then is stop contact with people and then social distancing. And this all might sound, you know, very complicated, but I, act, I really, really love the, the latest um, sort of control measures that the, the UK government have. And if you just flick on there, it's hands, face and space. If we keep it down to these three simple things, we're on a really, really good winner to help reduce the risk of transmission of this virus. And it really does come down to those three things. Wash your hands, cover your face and maintain social distancing. And there are those three things are really, really powerful. Um, and if everybody did that, we, we'd get less chance and uh, there'd be less harm as a result of this virus. OK, so I'll just flick on there. So it's about, it really is about identifying the hotspots. Um, we've done some studies and we found out what, um, where the most likely areas uh, of, of, let's say, contamination would be in, a, in particularly a school. Um, so it, the tests that we did weren't for coronavirus, but we, we, we used a, a, an ATP meter, which is, it, it tells us what living cells are in a particular area. And, but the more living cells, the dirtier the area, the more it's, it's an assumptive for a bacterial load, for example. So if we have identified those areas, it allows us then to put in controls and cleaning regimes around that, uh, so that will greatly reduce the transmission through indirect measures. Um, and this information, along with all of our expertise in our different businesses, such as property services and um, the pest control even, and uh, specialist hygiene, our cleaning company, we've devised a, a system where we can uh, risk um, assess an area based on the information, the inputs that we, and our ex expertise that we have. Um, and James is going to bring you through that a little bit later on. Um, we call it HATS, um, is, is our model, and he'll explain that a, a little bit further. So identifying those hotspots is really, really important, and having the, the information to do that is, is vital. So if you just flick on there, Katie. Then, you know, so bringing it into our world, um, another type of survey that we have done is, um, is, is, is a behavioural one. And so 62% of people think actually more could be done uh, to help us protect ourselves in the washroom. So this, it's in there, it's in the psyche that, hang on, the washroom is, is, is a, a risky place. 51% then they say they could be, they believe they could be exposed to coronavirus in the washroom. And, and this is very important. And we, we also know from science that um, it's spread by surfaces. Uh, it'll last on surfaces for, as we say, up to 72 hours is the, is the official line. Um, it can be passed through the aerosol. And now we also know that it can be passed through fecal matter as well. So it's not only a behavioral concept, it's also actual fact as well, that the, the washroom can be a risky area. So it's really important to, to put in control mechanisms around that uh, particular area, as well as the rest of, of your building. 
So Katie just flick on. So there's there's a few few urban myths out there, and uh, I'm going to try and dispel some of them. Uh, and you will probably have questions um, afterwards. But this first one here, some someone told me that disinfectants can remain active for weeks or or even months. Now this this is a real bugbear of mine. Um, they can't. They absolutely can't. Anybody who goes out and says this product will last for months is is talking nonsense. And I know some companies have been taken to task over some of the claims that they've made. That's an absolute nonsense. It's advocating really poor hygiene practices. Good hygiene practice would advocate clean the area and then disinfect, and that's called sanitate sanitization, and that's properly done. If you just go out and and you know do one or other. It's not great practice. So, um, and these these products are tested against certain standards. So, if you're if you're testing, uh, you, what I would advocate is you look at the label, for example, and if you see EN one one four four seven six on it, it means that it's been tested against viruses specifically, uh, and some reference viruses, which will give you some comfort to know that this thing will actually kill. Um, but uh, in terms of you know long longevity months is you're not going to get that out of a, a disinfectant that's crazy talk. Uh, the second one there is I I don't need to wash my hands if I use hand sanitizer. Well, you kind of do uh, because as I said just in the previous the previous um, um, cutting through the noise comment, it, the best practice is to wash and then um, disinfect. It, obviously, there'll be times where you can't wash this, you know, particularly in a school, you're not going to be able to have a, a hand basin there. So disinfecting is very good in that sense. You, you know, you are going to surface disinfect your hands and you're doing that on a regular point. Uh, you know, the, the government advocate that you do it on arrival and uh, you do it after breaks and when you're moving from class to class. And, and that's good practice. Um, and then wash your hands when you can. That's the, the that's the, that would be my best advice to everybody. Um, I bought 200 face masks for my staff. Um, are they suitable? Hmm. The this one is a this one's always an interesting one because really what you have to ask yourself at the at the get go is well what am I trying to control here? Am I trying to control transmission from me from a person or am I trying to protect um, getting uh, COVID-19 transmitted to me or both um, and then how risky is the environment are they is the area uh, you know a very confined space uh, is it well ventilated so you really have to do it's all risk based in terms of when you're looking at face masks um, so much so that if you look at the three main categories that we have we've got face coverings which is mandated or or um, advised in many many countries you've got uh, a mask, uh, which I, I would classify then as a, a you know a surgical mask, and then respirators. So face covering could be a scarf that'll give you about 50% coverage and protection from particulates. A mask, a surgical mask, is one way. It's not going to um, it's not going to protect people in the environment um, outside of you. It'll protect you. So it blocks it blocks the uh, particulates one way. And then respirators are, are there's three different grades here in the UK. We've got a P1, P2, and a P3. And they range from P1, giving you 80% protection, to 99.995% protection in a P3 mask. So really, you know, it really all depends on what situation you want to do and protect yourself and, and how risky is the area. So walking around in the public wearing a face mask as in a scarf is perfectly okay because you're in the open. But if you're in a confined space, I'd be advocating wearing a P3. Um, and then the other thing about masks is you've got filtered and or valved and non-valved. So if, uh, sometimes people use a little valve on it because like me, they wear glasses. So that helps um, the air go out so you don't get your glasses fogged up. But of course that just gives you one way protection you are being protected but if you have COVID you're not going to protect the people around you so those kind of things you just need to be be aware of before you you start going down the, the lines of you know blanket purchasing loads of loads of uh, masks all cleaning chemicals are the same I can use anything and it will still be effective well 
you can to a certain degree it again depends on what you're trying to achieve so you've got um you've got uh cleaning products which you know it's like soap water detergents all those kind of things they will give you some level of of uh you know protection against viruses um they will wash away some of it but they won't destroy them all of them um and again it's going back to this good practice of clean first then disinfect and then dry those those three steps are, are really really vital for this um some people say that look there's um there is a the, the, the cleaning product is is non-alcoholic uh, or the who say we have to have alcohol in it you don't there's um that might actually not be advisable in a school situation for you know it's it's alcohol it's you know people can drink it uh, and it's misuse of, of that product it can also cause sensitization to the skin drying of the skin or it might not be um uh, sensitive uh, to uh, or to to religious on um, religious beliefs and some some areas might not uh, advocate its use so there are products out there that that are not non-alcoholic um, and they don't contain uh, etoh and they are perfectly perfectly good what you want to do is check the label check the label for this en14476 and if that is on the label it means that that product if it's a disinfectant is effective against viruses it gives you that modicum of of comfort and you'll see that also um you'll see that uh, if you got that you got 99.99 percent as a minimum now 99.99 percent gives you protection against viruses that means that if there's a million viruses out there 99.99 percent means that potentially there's going to be 100 left so if you've got 99 percent uh, protection in a product that means there's going to be 10,000 left after a million viruses are on that surface so you you know not all chemicals are the same um, so you've got to check the label uh, to give yourself that that extra protection to reduce the risks further for your site. Katie. So on this, then it's like you know, this is that's a lot of information to take in one go. So how do how do you eat an elephant? It's bit by bit. And it's it's key then to to start approaching this in a logical way. How am I going to get control? How am I going to reduce the risks on my site in terms of um what kind of hygiene practices am i going to to implement um what about the atmosphere how is it going to you know are people going to be uh, affected by the virus is it going to be transmitted to them through the atmosphere and then also the touch points what kind of cleaning regime do i need to put in place what are the dirtiest points where where is the people most likely going to be to be uh, pick up the virus um indirectly through from others and then finally then is how am I going to implement social distancing how am I going to maintain um the controls within within the building so Jamie's going to take you over through that and uh, I'm going to stay quiet now for, for a little while thank you very much Dr Moore um okay let's have a look at the model that we use to break down the uh the way that we can implement controls in an environment in a school environment in this case and as Collins mentioned there, we use this HATS model. Um, we use H, hygiene factors, A for atmosphere, T for touch, touch points, and then S for social distancing. So let's take a look at our first one then. Um, this is H for hand hygiene in this case. So hygiene, hand hygiene. Uh, when we bear in mind that only 67% of people in the UK uh, wash their hands at all, um, after using a washroom, and only 16% do it correctly, it makes it even more important when we're talking about uh, hygiene, when we consider that it's one of the key methods of transmitting pathogens. 80% of communicable diseases are actually transmitted by touch. So this is a really important element of what we do. Now, the last nine months or so has probably brought hand hygiene to the fore. Um, and hopefully we're in a much better position now when it comes to just making sure that we wash our hands on a very regular basis compared to this time last year. Even so, that can be very difficult to, um, to take on board, uh, particularly if you are um, a school child. Um, what we'd suggest is making it almost an ethos in the classroom, good hand hygiene practices, making sure that 
we do take that time as the government advisors before uh, classes start, after classes, at break times, to make sure that we're actually uh, washing our hands um, thoroughly. As, uh, as Colin mentioned before, I think we're all pretty much sick of um, hearing um, happy birthday being sung twice, but it's a very good way of getting that in someone's head. This is how long 20 seconds actually is for washing our hands. It's also really important um, in any environment when you're looking at the controls and the measures to take um, to make sure that we work on an I need it now basis. And that means things like soaps, things like drying facilities, things like hand sanitizers, they should all be easily available at the point where you need them um, at the moment you need them. So if somebody does sneeze on a surface, for instance, you don't want to be looking around trying to find a sanitizer. And it's the same in a washroom environment. Um, all washrooms should have adequate, good quality soap. Um, they should have hand drying facilities and a means to dispose of those. Um, uh, if it's paper towels, for instance, to dispose of them, any waste. Um, and also a means to actually sanitize your hands regularly throughout the course of the day. And then finally, when it comes to this element with um, hand washing, I think it's really important to make that relevant to the age of the children in a school. You know your schools better than anybody. You know your classes and the children in there better than anybody. So um, think about how to introduce that into everyday activities, everyday um, uh, patterns that you have in a school. Just wait for the slide to move on. When it comes to the actual process of uh, washing your hands, um, it's very important, as we said before, to get that right. Um, and having some visuals around school can help. Having some um, instructions on how to actually uh, wash your hands properly can, can help. Um, it's also essential to make sure that time is allocated to do that. So think about how we can actually get children um, in to go and wash their hands before classes start. As far as the application itself goes, um, good quality soap, um, lots of warm water, uh, running warm water, no filling up a, a basin and then washing it in the dirty water underneath. Um, taking about 20 minutes to really make sure that we're washing our hands thoroughly, watching for those key areas, um, the back of the hands, round and in between fingers and thumbs, um, and then also thoroughly rinsing them and importantly drying them. Um, things like bacteria and viruses, um, bacteria in particular, will hang around uh, a lot better on a wet surface, on wet hands, than they would on dry hands. So having good quality um, hand dryers or paper towels available is absolutely um, essential, just as much as having good quality soaps. When it comes to considering the, uh, the products that you actually have in place, if we look at soaps, um, a high, you know, a high performance soap um, is very important, making sure that they're readily available throughout uh, the washroom environment and anywhere that hand washing will be taking place. It's also important to look at the actual uh, dispensers that we have here as well and make sure that they're positioned correctly. Uh, they're readily available in the case of soaps right next to the sinks. And then as far as um, hand sanitizers go, look at the dispensers that you have. Um, what we would suggest is walking the actual route of an environment of a building and making sure that those dispensers, oh, uh, making sure those dispensers are um, positioned correctly um, by doors and by, uh, by points where you would need them. Dr. Moore spoke earlier about um, hand sanitizer and the difference between potentially an alcohol and a non-alcohol based um, hand sanitizer. And alcohol sanitizers are absolutely um, fine. They're, they're very effective. Um, uh, ethanol based sanitizers um, are very effective at controlling pathogens, but there are also alcohol free alternatives available. Importantly, um, have a look on the label for that EM14476. And in an environment such as a school where um, the use of an alcohol-based sanitizer may not be as suitable, it's a real um, good alternative to have in place where you want something that's potentially a little bit more sensitive or alcohol-free. The key there is to make sure that you have something that is proven effective against viruses.
And then on the right hand side there, um, any surface disinfectants that you use in a school environment. Um, two real key pieces of information to take from that. Number one um, is to make sure that whatever you're using, it is readily available at the points that you need it. Um, we'd suggest using a surface sanitizer um, in a classroom, for instance, um, in between classes. Um, think about the touch points that are being used during the course of that class, during the course of the school day, um, and have a surface san uh, disinfectant available to use um, in between those sessions and when you're moving around the school. Um, so from one uh, bubble or group of students um, to the next, there is a defined break in that chain that Colin spoke about earlier, where we can introduce measures using surface disinfectants. And I'll speak a little bit more about how to do that um, a little bit later on. Just waiting for the slide. Thank you, Katie. Um, okay, schools can pose a challenge when it comes to trying to keep people moving, particularly where you've got um, bottlenecks. In any building, bottlenecks will occur where we're trying to get a large group of students or staff from one area to another. Um, and at the moment, we're trying to do so in a, a safe and responsible manner, keeping them apart from each other so they're socially distanced. Um, this can pose a challenge where you have uh, sanitizers, hand sanitizers uh, that need to be used before you move into an area. And one of the things to consider, along with positioning of some of these dispensers, is also the type of dispenser that you use. The one on the screen there is a rapid um, sanitizer dispenser. Um, this can um, this can provide up to 10,000 activations. It's a high volume, high capacity uh, solution where potentially you can get an activation every second. So it may be worth considering a high volume, high capacity solution, uh, a dispenser such as this in areas where you do get a bottleneck, um, potentially moving from one classroom environment to another, um, into a hall or at the end of the day, or the start of the day, trying to get everyone through into or certain groups into one area. Um, consider the way you can do that with a high volume solution such as this. And this particular one also uses an alcohol-free um, sanitizer too, which is suitable, as we mentioned before, for schools. Moving away from RH onto the A for atmosphere, um, the, we know that uh, coronavirus um, can be transmitted um, in an airborne fashion, um, hence the fact we're, we're, we're uh, wearing masks, we're wearing face coverings. Um, the current guidance from the government is to ensure that areas are ventilated, indoor areas are ventilated as often as possible. Now, this can, can provide a few challenges, but I think um, there are opportunities during the course of a school day to open windows, open doors and try and ventilate a room as best as possible. Um, one air change, so an entire air change from opening doors and windows um, can reduce the level of pathogens, airborne pathogens, by as much as 63%. So where it allows, where the school day allows, try and vent the, uh, the classrooms before um, children, pupils arrive at break times and also after the end of the day, if you can, for 15 to 20 minutes. On the same atmosphere topic, it's really important to try and uh, reinforce a catch it, bin it, kill it um, model within the school. We're coming in now to the traditional cold and flu season. There's a lot of runny noses out there. Um, so make sure that tissues are readily available in every classroom. Have facilities to dispose of them correctly and then wash your hands afterwards. But importantly, really try to re-emphasize that, particularly to younger children. Try to catch it with a tissue um, or as an absolute last resort into your elbow. Um, and then if, you, if you've used a tissue, bin that tissue and then wash your hands afterwards and you're controlling spread of any uh, viruses by doing so. And then finally on the, the topic of atmosphere, um, we talk about HVAC and ventilation systems. Um, the, the current guidance is, um, is to make sure that any air handling systems, any ventilation systems are maintained and run as normal to keep that airflow going. Um, in a classroom environment. The real key with that is the majority of systems will have a good quality filter inside them. Um, 
make sure they're well maintained, make sure they're maintained on a regular basis and there's no breaks or anything like, like that in the system. And that will um, keep good quality air flow within a classroom environment. Cheers, Katie, thank you. If you could move the slides, I think, from there. Okay, um, and one final piece around atmosphere. Um, we're coming back into the washroom again, and um, we're looking at the way we can actually dry our hands in a washroom. The, the best advice at the moment is to use um, paper towels or a good quality ha um, hand air dryer. Uh, the example you can see on here, which is initials pebble unit, um, this has a HEPA 14 filter in there, uh, meaning that it's, it's, um, it's filtered air that's being used. Um, it's uh, low power consumption, and it, by using a good quality um, hand dryer, you're helping to prevent the spread of anything that would otherwise be present in the air in a washroom environment. So, moving away from atmosphere to surface, and we, um, surface touch points, should I say. So, the T in hats is touch points. Now, there can be hundreds, if not thousands, of touch points within a um, school, within a classroom. And trying to break that down and, and introduce um, cleaning and sanitization into that can be quite a daunting um, process. Break it down by walking that route. Um, think about everything that you actually touch as you do so. So go through the, the school as you enter that classroom environment um, and make a note of all those key touch points where somebody else will interact with. Things such as door handles, quite obvious ones. Things such as desks, um, pens, pencils that will be used in the classroom, but also some of the ones that potentially might, uh, might escape your notice. Um, some of the other station that could be used, for instance. And then once you've got that list, that forms the basis for a, um, a, a risk mitigation strategy. That's the place where we introduce the surface disinfection for all these surfaces. Some of those, it will be a case of those touch points I used or touched and interacted with several times a day. Door handles being a prime example, lots of people are going to touch that door handle during the course of the day. Whereas others, such as the chair, a pupil's chair, they may only have that particular pupil touching it each day. So the next stage, once you've identified these touch points, is work out how frequently they need to be disinfected. And things like those frequent touch points, like door handles, um, they should be several times throughout the course of the day certainly before classes start, certainly um, on break times, um, and certainly before, for instance, lunchtime, before people actually then move out to go get their lunch. Whereas things like chairs, uh, they're not as often uh, going to be interacted with by, um, by other people, and they could be maybe daily or twice daily. And then once we've actually, apologies, Katie, could you skip back a slide, please? Thank you. And then once you've actually identified those touch points, it's also very important, as Colin mentioned earlier, to make sure that we disinfect those um, correctly. The best way to do that is to clean a surface first, then apply a disinfectant, and then allow it to dry. If we only apply disinfectant to a surface, to a dirty surface, it won't be effective, but it needs to be clean first to remove that grime, that dust uh, that might be present first. But once these schedules are implemented, it's a case of clean it, apply a disinfectant, and then allow that to dry. And that's how we can sanitize a surface. Katie, could you skip on, please? And the final letter in our HATS acronym is S, social distancing. Now, this can be one of the most challenging to implement in a school environment. Um, particularly younger children, they will want to interact with their environment um, through touch as much as possible. And it can be quite difficult uh, trying to get them to maintain any sort of social distance, let alone two metres. But there's a few things we can do here. 
Um, certainly by now you'll have your own uh, measures in place in the school about trying to keep people uh, moving from one route, uh, one way systems for instance, bubbles, um, groups of, of students which will be kept as a, as, as a um, for instance, a separate class. Um, and also things like making sure that um, you've got reduced occupancy in, in areas where you don't need to have people in as much as um, perhaps you did before. But it's also quite an idea to have things like a visual reminder. Um, think about posters, think about um, the, the students in there, particularly for younger ones, nice bright colours um, with, with lots of pictures on and make it age appropriate the way we actually reinforce this social distancing measure. One good way to do so, um, it's very difficult to miss a large um, floor mat with two meters and um, hazard warnings and things like that on. As you can see there, there are images of some of the, the floor mats that are available and they are a nice visual reminder. This is two meters um, and this is how far apart you should be keeping in this particular area. Katie, could you move on one please? So this is the model that we use when we carry out any surveys um, in any building. We use this HATS um, model to break down and make it uh, those bite-sized chunks um, to work out how we can introduce control measures into any place uh, that we survey. Um, but it's something that you can implement yourselves as well and just use these four things, um, hygiene, atmosphere, touch and social distancing. Um, and by doing so and using some of the things that I've discussed there, it's possible to break down um, the challenge of getting all these different control measures in place and making school environments as safe and as hygienic um, as possible. What we can do as well, we use the same model as I say, uh, we can use that HATS model um, in your school environments. Um, and we can come do a free survey using that principle and provide you with the information so you can then go and implement those controls um, in, your, um, in your buildings, in your schools. We also have a range um, of visuals. We have a range of uh, posters that can help reinforce and remind people about the need to, to wash hands, for instance, um, or use uh, hand sanitizers on a regular basis. And these are age appropriate. So for instance, the ones on the right hand side of the screen there, um, very much for younger primary school children, for, um, for example, and then over on the left, getting a bit more um, up into um, uh, uh, the older age ranges. And everybody on this call, what we will do is make sure that um, if, you, if you want to, you can get one of those free posters for your schools. Colm spoke earlier on as well about um, when he was busting through some of these myths and dispelling some of the misinformation about there. One of the questions in there was around PPE and he's provided some really valuable information about the different types of masks, respirators and face coverings. Um, one of the things that's come out of the pandemic is the fact that it, it can be very difficult to, um, to know um, exactly where you're getting the equipment you need, particularly if it's something that's relatively new and we haven't had that much demand for um, in schools, things such as um, gloves, PPE. So what we've done at initial is um, we've actually launched an online web shop where you know you can get all the different things you would need um, to use in your school environments, such as um, reliably sourced and appropriate PPE, uh, can now all be sourced uh, through the one place, through the initial web shop. So to summarise, um, we've, we've looked at cutting through the noise um, of some of the things that are out there. Dr Moore has taken us through that um, that infection chain and the way that we can introduce controls into any environment to help break up that chain of infection. Um, we've also looked at some of the practical and real life applications and where we can actually use um, things like sanitizers, soaps, hand dryers, introducing those um, or making sure we've got the right ones in a school environment to, um, to improve and maintain those hygiene levels and keep staff pupils safe. So that concludes the webinar for today. Um, 
I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've uh, taken something away from it. And at this point, I will pass back to Katie to field any questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Colmore and Jamie. That was very informative. Um, if anyone would like to ask some questions, feel free to put them uh, to us now. Um, there is a, uh, I think it's the fourth icon down on the right hand side of your screen. It should be a speech bubble um, with a question mark in it. So if you click on that, then the questions come through to me and I can put them to, um, to Colm and Jamie for you. Um, I have had a couple in already. Um, so just um, to, to ask those to start with, um, someone has asked, they only have cold, a cold water tap or cold water source in their classroom. Is that still going to be effective for hand washing? Uh, yes. Um, so cold water uh, soap, it's the soap that actually starts to break away the little protein. So on the coronavirus, there's a little protein around the edge. You know, those spiky bits that everybody sees in the, in the images. Um, Without that coating, it won't be able to adhere to the host and it'll it'll die. So, it, you know, soap and water will greatly reduce the, the virus in itself. And then what you're going to do is with the disinfectant after that, it's a belt and braces. So you're going to get knock out whatever's left. So, yes. Great, thank you. Um, someone has asked about uh, Sanitizer dispensers, do they hold more sanitizer than the small pump but bottles? Um, they've just noticed they're going through um, a large number of bottles of sanitizer at the moment in their school. So they're looking for a more effective way. Yes, um, they certainly can. And this is actually something that we've uh, had a fair bit of feedback on. Um, it can seem like the right thing to do to have um, lots of very small uh, bottles, little hand pump bottles in key places. Um, but in those bottlenecks that I spoke about earlier, um, what you don't want is people searching for lots of little bottles which can often go missing. Um, the rapid sanitizer dispenser that we saw earlier has got a five litre um, tank in there, um, plus a, um, the capacity for another a backup five litres. So you talked about 10 litres of um, hand sanitizer. Um, and the other thing that does as well, particularly now that we've got more and more protocols about letting people into a building, um, it actually reduces the, the amount of time you need to come in and replace those. So you've got a high capacity, high volume solution, um, which means that you can get people through those bottlenecks and let the bottleneck areas um, quicker and they don't have to um, go without hand sanitizer. Okay, thank you. Um, another one just in, um, when disinfectant has been diluted, how long does it last in a spray container? Dilution, um, well, you, if, it, if it comes as a concentrate, uh, one would want to dilute it in accordance with the, with the label. Uh, if, 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 you, if you dilute it beyond uh, what it should be, uh, you then render it ineffective. It's it's you know it's nothing less than water. Um, I, am I picking that question up right? Um, well, I mean that, that's how it's coming. When disinfectant has been, I mean we could go back direct to the the person that's asked that question if, yeah. if there's more clarity required. Um, but I think I guess in some of the concentrates they are asking or it does recommend you dilute it by a certain amount with water, you know, like different floor mm. cleaners and stuff. So I guess what they're saying is how long is that then going to be effective? If you put that in a spray bottle, is that going to well, be effective it, for a period of time? It, it certainly will. It depends on the on the product, of course, but um, by by their very nature, they're, they're, you know, they're antimicrobials. So they're going to, they will have quite a shelf life. Uh, you won't get any bugs growing on them because that's what they're designed to kill. So, uh, but I would check the label and make sure that you don't over dilute it. Um, another question, what would you say is, oh sorry, it's music, say is the biggest risk of infection spread in primary schools and secondary schools? Is there a notable difference between the two groups? Um, Jamie, you, you're going to take that one, yeah? So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just gonna say, I, I think um, firstly for me, uh, it, it can be quite difficult, particularly with younger children. I've got two, um, two children myself, seven and four, who are back at primary school. 
and getting them to stay away from other people is very difficult um, and that's why trying to re-emphasize on a daily basis this need for social distancing yes try and, and emphasize it um, but also smaller children younger children interact with their environment by touching things much more than for instance older children adults do um, so regular disinfection of surfaces is absolutely key um, across the board in schools but particularly when it comes to younger children to stop them um, picking things up as much as as they ordinarily would and, and to add to that if I, if I could say i think younger children are easier they love routine and uh, they're easier to 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 teach. Um, my my two came in into the house uh, very early on in March, and they were you know sneezing into their arms. They were washing their hands, singing Happy Birthday twice. It, it's you know it, it's so easier. So in many ways, for for younger children to adhere to those instructions, as it might be a little bit more difficult because of the rebellious nature of teenagers, or uh, they just don't listen, uh, or their head is somewhere else. So uh, I, I think that that may play a part to that as well. Great. Oh, um, someone sorry. has asked if the webinar will be available to watch over again. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, can. Someone uh, yeah. has asked if the webinar will be available will be available to watch again. Um, yes, we will make um, a recording of this webinar available. So the person that's asked that question, I will make sure that link is sent to you in the next forty eight hours. Um, another question we have is, should we be making outside equipment like benches and play equipment off limits or can we safely protect it? Um, if, it's, if it's external, I mean, the, the, the likelihood of survival on the surface is relatively low, particularly if you've got a cleaning regime in place. So, um, and again, if, you're, if, you're, if your procedure, let's say, is Right, playtime is over. We all come in. What do you do? You wash your hands and you sanitize your hands. So you're minimizing the risk of, of uh, cross contamination at that point. So, cleaning regime plus uh, hand hygiene uh, regime would, would greatly minimize that. I think I see a lot of seats cordoned off, and I'm, I'm scratching my head as to why uh, in, in restaurants and, and places and, and all sorts of uh, outdoor uh, areas where. You know, if you if you still stick to that mantra of face, hands and space, right? Hands, face and space. Keep sticking to that. Um, you you can't go too far wrong. Um, and if you build in the controls around it, you'll you'll greatly reduce the risk of transmission. I think if I could just add to that as well, um, the you know, the benefits of outdoor exercise and play are are huge. And one of the things we do know is that um, typically things like uh, like flu, um, you, you, you know, seasonal flu, um, transmission can increase in indoor areas as opposed to outdoors. So try if you've got the opportunity in a school environment to to use outdoor areas, absolutely do so. And, and okay. further to that, the greatest risk, sorry, Katie, the, the greatest risk is, is what happens outside the school. And, and it's communication between parents. And as I said, if everybody followed this, you know, the three steps, if everybody in the country followed that, there, there'd be very little risk with this in terms of transmission. So, it, you know, the level of control that I see in the schools is phenomenal. Um, but the level of control outside of the school is not. So the likelihood actually of transmitting anything is probably from external rather than internal. Um, and the final question that's come in um, is with all the news headlines and reports of some schools shutting or sending different classes home, can I still feel safe in school? Well, I think I, think I might have just answered that. I, I would say yes. I think um, it's inevitable that we're, we're, we're getting this. We said this last month uh, in a previous webinar, we said, look, the biggest key on this, so the, the most essential thing is communicating with parents. Getting, get, it's getting them educated in many cases as to you know, what they should do. And if everybody followed the hands, face, space mantra, it, it would, uh, we wouldn't have a, a major problem. So I think you're, you're more likely to be uh, 
at risk of transmitting externally than I am internally. And I'm very confident um, with the control measures that are in, in place in schools. It's just inevitable that um, I think the root cause of those closures are probably coming from the community rather than the school. That's my own personal Great. opinion. Well, thank you both for the, um, answering those questions. Those are all the questions we've had in. If anyone thinks of a question post this webinar that they would like to ask, then please feel free um, to, to send an email over to me um, or to uh, the, the contact details you can see there, and, um, and we will get your, your question answered for you. And I, I don't know if you want to wrap up with a thank you, Colm. I think that's... That's all we have today. Sure, yeah. I, yeah, I think so. And I think I, I, just to echo Katie's words, if, if anybody does have any questions, just pop us an email, pop us a line, and uh, and we get them. I hope you've got taken something from this. We've covered quite a, an array um, of, of topics and information, um, and hopefully we've given you some tools and, and uh, some tips and hints to, uh, to try and help, uh, if nothing else, a review of what your process is at the moment. Um, so uh, thanks for attending. Thank you.